welcome to the virtual happy hour experience with the drunken grape extraordinary drinks with extraordinary people i am your host rob and we have a stellar guest today this gentleman has been integral in the canadian uh food and beverage scene for i would say at least three decades maybe even four he is a uh, fixture in the Canadian wine scene as well. He was the host of this brilliant LCBO podcast series, which I think averaged for my, um, I was skimming over it this morning again, and it averaged about 150,000 views a segment. I, this is just incredible. He has influenced literally tens of thousands of wine students, including myself. These courses helped me get the LCBO, uh, or sorry, the W set level three, um, very successfully in a condensed format. And he's also a professor now or a lecturer at George Brown University, he has his own business, Uncork One, I believe is the name of it. He is a highly con uh, sought after consultant around the globe. Let's introduce him, Michael Fagan. Welcome to the show, my friend. This is an absolute joy to have you here. Hello, Rob. It's great to be here as well. Thank you very much for letting me be part of your series. Well, and you know, and, and talking about series, we'll, we'll get to that for sure. And of course, we're going to crack a drink. It's the happy hour. That'll be coming up. How did you get started into this world? And it's people like you that actually really helped motivate and propel me. I was going through my level three course. At the time, it was condensed. And you can imagine over a six-week period, I ended up passing with merit. I think we only had one distinction out of 33 students. It's not an easy feat when you take a course like that and chop it into six weeks. And your programming on the LCBO podcast really helped me. But going back, I mean, this is going sort of towards the, the mature part of your career. How did you get started? Canada wasn't exactly a budding wine scene in the 1980s. Or a budding wine scene in the 1970s. Okay. <laughs> My my yeah. career with my wow. career in hosp my career in hospitality and beverage alcohol uh, started in the mid seventies, um, and my career with the LCBO I, I joined the LCBO in 1975. Uh, I'm I'm from Ottawa. I st I started working in a liquor store on Isabella Street in Ottawa in 1975 as a part time employee. Uh, wow, you know. As time went on, you know, you, it, it was a cool place to work. It was a different experience then. You may not recall, Rob, but in those days, it was called what they referred to as a counter store. So yes. all the product was behind the counter. And I was yes. one of those young bucks that would wrap your products up and put it in a bag and have you shipped out with, before you knew what was going on. Um, and then, and then I, I continued my career in Ottawa. I became a permanent employee at the LCBO, working in various liquor stores. Um, in, the, in the mid eighties, I, I switched, stayed with the LCBO, but I became a wine consultant. They had this role in the stores that were these wine consultants. At the time, there was about 25 of them across the province. And you know they were your product experts. And I looked at these gentlemen and I said, man, that's an interesting, interesting career. Uh, but I wasn't sure about the approach they took to everything. So I started learning more about wine myself. And in Ottawa, it, I, Bud Holland was one of the gentlemen in Ottawa. He ran a wine class school out of the Ottawa Citizen Building on Baxter Road. And that oh, wow. was all Ottawa had for learning about wine. So a buddy that I worked with and myself, we took the course. And then we challenged ourselves to learn more because my father taught me a very important lesson. He said, Michael, a couple of things. And he says, as you consider your career, two things. One, learn to work with your mind, not your back. Second, if you're going to be in sales and you're going to be directing people and helping customers, make sure you understand the product that you're selling. So I took that to heart. I started learning about the wines that I sold in a liquor store. And with my buddy, we challenged ourselves. okay, this year we are gonna try every wine in the store under $10. So every payday we split on a bottle of wine and we started teaching ourselves about wine. Uh, we took the WSET program by correspondence. And uh, in the mid, in the, later on, I became a, a wine consultant with the LCBO. 
uh, working in the stores in Ottawa. We opened the first vintages store downtown in the market. That was a new approach. You know, the older stores were tucked in the corner of, the, of another liquor store and they were really customer friendly. They had signs on the entranceway that said, no carts beyond this point. And you walked into this section of the store and it was almost like a funeral home. Everything was on display. <laughs> it was quiet. It was surreal. Uh, and I said, this has got to change. So uh, we opened the vintages store in Ottawa. And then I got a phone call <clears throat> inviting me to uh, see if I might be interested to come to Toronto for four months uh, to help restructure the department that I was reporting to. I said, well, that sounds pretty cool. So in 1989, I, I accepted the challenge. I commuted to Toronto for four months, uh, helped restructure the department. Four months turned into a year of commuting uh, back and forth and opportunities to restructure uh, what is currently today now known or went from you know wine services to vintages product knowledge support to what is still called today the knowledge resources group. So I you know built that department up. Uh, looked after all the product consultants, uh, which by the time I, I left, I retired from the LCBO in 2014. And, uh, you know, there's 300 plus product consultants now. There were 28 when I started. So that's wow. huge growth. That is. The vintage's business has grown fantastic. So that, that's, I've always had a passion for trying to take, you know, the mystery out of the bottle. I want people to understand beverage alcohol in a responsible way. I was responsible for teaching LCBO staff. And so I created different programs, a product knowledge course, the video series, tasting programs, a plethora of things. Um, yeah, and, no kidding. Yeah. So, the, I mean, the message for this is- What a journey. You know, I'm a kid from Ottawa. I worked in a liquor store. I was able to move into head office. If you have a vision, if you have the plan and you can express it, you can, you can go anywhere in any company and do anything that you need to do. You know, and that's what a brilliant journey because you, I talked about this, it may have been, I believe it was with our good friend, Roger Middag, that actual show is coming up uh, on YouTube. Uh, well, it'll precede this one, but you know, we always record in advance. It's always the way show business is done, but it's uh, the prohibition era. You both came through it and felt it. I think going back, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the 70s, and I was a little, little boy then, I remember going up to the window with my grandfather and he'd stop the car and go, he's like, Robert, I'm going to go get some beer. And next thing you know, it was in a brown bag. He went up to the window. Somebody just handed it to him. You could see the bottles behind him. He sort of pointed at what he wanted. And that was it. There was no, I mean, the evolution of the LCBO has been incredible from that point forward. And you're talking about an era where I believe women still had to be escorted into taverns with men. They had a lady section with the, the escort section, and then they had the men's section. Just I think that sign is still up at the Prescott Hotel. <laughs> yeah, actually it is. And they got some strange, strange practices back then that we look at now. And it's funny because I had a virtual event just this past Friday for a great group from FFN Video here in Ottawa. It's a company that spans into the States. And I brought this up to a largely uh, older millennial crowd. You know, the mature, they're professionals now, they're into their 30s. And they just looked at me stunned when I brought that up. They were like, brown paper bag, a chaperone section. Like, this is just foreign concepts to them. Yeah, the, and to think society, about it, that, society has evolved. Society yeah, has evolved. Absolutely. And to think about how you lived through that and where your career went through the golden age of this takeoff or explosion. You know, we think of Mulroney's government in the 1980s, where they wanted to uh, really focus on Canadian wine production. I know that was under his uh, prime ministerial reign. They influenced the province of Ontario to really look at this along with BC and some of the hotspot wine growing regions that have really emerged and now produce world-class wines were really sort of in their impetus. I mean, you look at prohibition, it shut everything down really effectively from, I don't know, 1916 all the way up to 1973. And Inniskillen was the first winery to reappear at that time. Yeah, well actually- and you're pro part pro of pro all this. Pro prohibition, you know, if we wanna go dates, 
But the LCBO was born as a From result it. of the end of prohibition. Yes. So that when prohibition ended and in 1927, the LCBO was formed to provide a channel for the responsible sale of beverage alcohol. And it took a long time to mature. And, it, you know, if, and we are totally honest with ourselves when I was at the LCBO, in, in the 70s, it was more of a distributor than a retailer. And, uh, you know, I, I'm thankful that I, I was there at a time when they were looking for entrepreneurial spirit. They were looking to change the customer experience. They were giving value to product knowledge and recognizing that beverage alcohol can be consumed in a responsible manner. And they tried to project that through the stores. So, you know, it started with people first being able to pick up and touch the bottles themselves. And then we started, you know, when, when I went down to the team and we were in the 89, in 89 early 90s, that was, we really had a big change on what that customer experience was about. And that, that was a big focus for me is let's make it a customer experience because a knowledgeable customer is a better customer. A Absolutely. knowledgeable employee is yep. a better employee. As a matter of fact, the correspondence course that we have for all employees that's in retail, it's all employees. Even the senior vice president of retail had to successfully complete that program. And I was the one who had to judge and mark their exams. And it wasn't an, it wasn't easy to go to the senior VP of retail and go, <laughs> no, you maybe failed. that didn't work so well this time. We'll do some room. <laughs> <Pro, laughs> yeah, it's one of those cases. It almost makes me think of when uh, my brother was talking to me about basic training. He's a, mili he's a uh, major in the Air Force. And when you're an officer cadet, you're actually told what to do by sergeants and sergeant majors in training, even though they're technically yeah. a lower rank. Yeah. And he even said, you get to a base and you got the warrant officer who supersedes pretty much everybody except for the commanding officer and the commanding officer's right arm, which would be the second in command. Then they only report to those two people. And it was, it's one of those organizations as well where somebody of a lesser rank can actually be grading and teaching somebody and then go, sorry, you fail. And then you got to deal with the consequences afterwards. It's hilarious. Yeah. But, but it's all got, it's all done in good spirit, right? They never fail. They just need more coaching. And yeah. then we coach them and we bring them forward and they're, suc and they're successful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, you listen, and I know you're brilliant at coaching people, you know, we're going to get into that just in a second, but this journey of the LCBO that you've been part of has been fantastic. You know, you went from an operation that was really a takeout window to an entire guest experience, not only in the store with the tastings, the seminars, they got some brilliant courses. If you're an aficionado or a generalist, the LCBO is a great place to go to really get your hands wet and really your palate wet. That's really why you're there, right? That's but right. if you look at it, um, how did you fall into that really cool bracket of videography and the LCBO? I'm, I'm envious. What a great gig. Now, my, no. like I said, I was going through 2013 WSET level three, and one of our teachers recommended that, you, that we watch this podcast series if we're stuck. Most of the students did not, and I think it had a big hand in why they did not pass. You know, I passed and did well, and I can tell you those courses to this day still have massive, massive impact. I mean, how was that journey traveling around the world and, and, and shooting all this stuff? That must have been a blast. It, it, was, it was very interesting. And I, th I think it, 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 it was born of myself not knowing any better or thinking I couldn't do it. Uh, I, I, I was very fortunate as the head of the department that when principals and winemakers and owners came to the country and into our market, they would want to meet with me and they'd want to meet with our, my team. That was a small team at head office Toronto. I had 6,000 employees across Ontario that I'm trying to reach. So I had this idea of maybe we start recording them. And so uh, with one of my colleagues at the LCBO, we grabbed a video camera. And when these principals were in town, you'd meet with them. I said, let's just record it. So my very first interview with Barrett was with Baroness Philippine de Rothschild. What oh, an wow. intimidating personality. Oh, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> so that was that I said, Rothschild, multi-billionaire, <laughs> global magnate, has no time for any time wasted, but probably really engages if you oh, do so, make the time yeah, valuable, yeah. which you did, yeah. obviously, and he probably yeah. loved it. Yeah, it was, uh, she did. It was great. Or she did. That's time. awesome. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, 
I, it was a proof of concept. We, so we started doing that. And then, you know, we started uh, getting more advanced, increasing the production value, and eventually with, uh, with the industry support uh, through marketing companies, uh, wine associations, and individual wineries uh, partnering and collaborating with me to make these things happen, uh, we created what is today known as the Discover uh, Wine Series. And uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, hundreds of thousands of hits. Uh, yeah, this, this, per this episode. Series, it's all out there on YouTube. Actually, one of the episodes is a million and four, 1.4 million views. Uh, wow. 1.4 million views know, off something that. that was created by a kid from Ottawa. I mean, that, that's Digest fantastic. Digest that for a second. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, high-end celebrity numbers. Like that's, that's, that's Joe that's Rogan silly. doesn't necessarily have a million views on every yeah. episode. Think about that. I, Think I about was that just for surprised. A I was surprised. And, and it's amazing. Great. Think about that. That's staggering. Yeah. It's amazing the reach it has. When, when I travel, and I still travel a lot, it doesn't matter where I go. When, when my wife and I, we were in Prince Edward Island. We're, we're going into a liquor store, and I'm asking some of the staff for help. And one of the other associates come over and say, you're Michael Fagan. I recognize your voice from the video series. <laughs> I said, we were in Mexico at the resort we were staying at where the sommelier is helping us make some decisions for, with matching our wine. And he's looking at me curiously and he, he comes back afterwards. He says, do you have a video series? He says, I've seen your video series. It's helped me with English. It's helped me with my product knowledge. He says, that's fantastic. Thank you. And I had a buddy of mine and he was traveling in, in Dubai in the airport and the bartender in the airport had it on. And he's, wow. he's texting me, he said, wow. this is weird. That's awesome. It's, yeah. uh, I remember when I first met you in person, we were at the Ottawa Wine and Food Show, the last show in its 33 yeah. year history. And I remember you were coordinating everything. You had a big job over that weekend. You were yeah. handling speakers. I believe you were also a featured speaker. You handled the mayor coming in. You handled all the distribution of our product. I know I had to pop in in the morning. I remember you were laughing because I went to a party the night before and you're like, you did it. <laughs> Why did you do that? But anyway, enough said about that. What a great experience. What a great event. And uh, I thought you did a great job managing that. And it's cool to see somebody in action that you saw in video. Like you got to see them in video and how they influenced your own education. And, you know, and then, of course, we started seeing each other. And hopefully this all comes back with Piero Titoni and his group with the Italian uh, wine show. What a brilliant show that is in Toronto and all the other segues and segments that they have, like Taroni Restaurant gets booked up for an event in the evening or in the afternoon. And mm -hmm. it's just great. And, you know, talking a bit about a little bit further about that. What are you doing now? I know you have your consulting company. You launched that, I believe. That was all part of what brought you to the Ottawa Wine and Food Show and has brought you into a lot of these places. And from what I understand, you, someone like you with your pedigree, you probably have quite a few clients from around the globe that you work with quite actively, yeah. probably still to I, this day. I, I do have a, a very wide-reaching Rolodex, if people remember what Rolodexes are. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the Ottawa Wine Show, I, I mean, I've been involved with that since it started. Uh, I used I to, believe that uh, I, I used to look after the operate the retail operations there, the running the store, the tasting booth. Actually, the Ottawa Wine Show was the first place that a bottle of spirits was sold on a Sunday, and I sold that really? bottle of spirits. Yeah, so <laughs> you, you think back, you know, some of some of the memories you have. Um, but when I retired from the LCBO, I, I thought, well, I, I'm. I'm just, I'm not ready to just do nothing. I have to do something. So I thought, and everybody said, Fagan, you're one of the most marketable people that we have in the company. So you, you'll do fine. So I thought, well, let me put my hat out and see what happens. And so I, I do have some clients in Italy that I work with and they're, they're, uh, they're event management groups and marketing groups. So I help them with uh, activations in Ontario for their clients. I help uh, coordinate uh, B2B meetings and bring new producers into the market that are interested in doing business in Canada. I speak regularly at different events. And uh, I'm also working with uh, George Brown College. And I've yeah. been with George Brown College uh, since 2014. Uh, and they call me their, uh, their expert in residence for wine. 
So at the college, and it's actually, it's, it's the Ottawa connection. There's one, one of the directors at the college, Tony Garcia, his family is an Ottawa family as well. Uh, some people may remember Don Alfonso restaurant. Uh, that, that, was, that was their business. And Tony, I've, I worked with Tony with Ontario uh, on, um, we, we've sat on committees on boards together with Ontario Tourism. And so we, we got to know each other. And when he joined the college, he said, uh, Fagan, you can't sit still. Come and join us here and help us because, you know, George Brown College is the number one college from a culinary side in Canada. And they're, they're recognized around the world. And they wanted to elevate their beverage alcohol programming. And they thought I, because of my experience, I'd be an asset. Well, of course. So, so we've been working together with it. And our first project together, actually, is what you see behind me. Yeah, uh, no, I love is, it. Th this is a classroom. This is the tasting room that we designed and built. Where's that students. when I was in school? I know, right? <laughs> so, so when you know, we were we were very fortunate. We we were able to design something from scratch. So, if you were designing a room uh, that was going to have everything you always thought it should have to be a greatest wine theater, that's what we put in there. Uh, and so, we also uh, at the college. It's nice to have a nice tasting room, but you have to have programs too. So working with the uh, we're working with faculty, we uh, we developed and designed um, uh, an, a postgraduate degree in advanced wine and beverage business management. Uh, so it's a, a one year program. Uh, students learn the business of beverage alcohol. They learn about the product. They leave with WSET. Uh, they leave with the Prudhomme Beer School. Um, and they learn about marketing, they learn communications, they, they learn, they can read a spreadsheet, uh, you know, they learn the business. So they're well, well set to come into the business and into industry. And with that program, I also designed, um, I've always been a big fan of experiential learning. So I, I, we've included a component, an optional comp component to that study, where it's a, a European tour. So we, we, go, we go to school across Europe. Uh, when we That's first cool. designed it, we took them to Scotland. Uh, we spent a day at Innocent Gun, and we met all the directors from Innocent Gun in oh, a wow. full-day class uh, from all the departments. We went to Glen Kinchy and, and learned about the making of whiskey. From there, we uh, we went to Belgium at Chimay with the Trappist Oh, monks. yeah. Yeah, and I love that, that brought back memories because I did a video there when I did a video on the beers of Belgium. From there, we follow the bubble, bubble theme and went to Champagne and spent the day at Bollinger and at Moet. And then, uh, you know, we mix it up. You know, sometimes we go to Burgundy and then it's off to Italy, northern Italy, central Italy. We go to Abruzzo and uh, we wrap it all up in Spain. And in Spain, they, they learn about Cava and Priorat and then they bring them back. But it's a two and a half week program. Uh, it's intense, it's enjoyable, but it's, oh, it's, a lot sure of bus, it's, enjoyable. It's, it's a lot of bus time, but it, you, the, um, the, the, the collaborative partners we have, they really open their doors. You have the heads of the department, it's structured learning, it's tastings, it's good food and meals as, as well, because <laughs> you know wine isn't just the product, it's everything else that goes Absolutely. around. Absolutely. You know, and I think it's great because you really nail a few things uh, for the viewers. You're watching this. First of all, make sure to subscribe to this channel. Make sure to hit likes. Make sure to share this content. Um, make sure to check out the website, thedrunkengrape.com. Also, I will have Michael's full profile written down in the description, how you can reach out to him. A um, bit of info about George Brown College, because I think, and this is where my tie-in comes, I think this program is fantastic. You see... I had to step out. I was working with a company called Groovy Grapes. Not sure if you remember them, Michael. They were a bad company yeah. for a while. Yeah. That was yeah. my start coming out as a budding wine professional back in 2013. And uh, after about a year and a half of schooling between the level two and level three, and you really need the level three to really get up and running. It's mm -hmm. comprehensive. It's a great program. But what you've done would have been my dream back in 2013 or 2012, when I started with Vendage Institute, had that been here, I definitely would have taken that one year program over anything. And I had to seek out Prude Home. So I had this class and this is hilarious. I have this group of fire chiefs come in. I tell this story because it really is my start into Prude Home. This is 2014. You got 22 of these highly sophisticated fire chiefs from around the world. And some of them are European and they wanted beer on the menu at the last minute. 
So I knew nothing about beer. Literally, I grabbed my book, La Rose Gastronomy. I bought it about a week before, turned to the page about beer. They have about two pages on beer. The difference between an ale, which is top fermented, a lager, which is bottom fermented, gives you a basic breakdown, tells you basically to look at various colors as it goes darker on the ale spectrum. It goes more and more with things like stews and red meats. And, you, you know, you get the picture. It's like white wine, red wine. I jumped in, winged it. And then next day I'm like, shit, I got to go online now and find who the hell has a program. And I'd heard this mentioning of Prudhomme and this Roger Midag character. So I ended up enrolling into level one, loved it, went into level two, got to level three, finished that. I'm about to commence into level four whenever it comes into Ottawa, the pandemic shifted that, but it's okay. Like you teach level two. And I know level two for me was the level at which you can really go out and professionally work with it. Not only do you know styles, you've done some blind tastings. Um, I know the way Roger writes that you have to present a research paper. You have to talk about the, 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 the essence of cut, complement, contrast with food pairing concepts. And to have this all under one umbrella with the WSET level three, you got your level two prude home, then you've got all the beverage management and business courses. And that is critical. I have talked to MWs that actually turned around and said, we had to relearn everything on business because it was so academic on wine. We knew nothing about the actual business. People would high five me saying, yay, you're an MW, come to this event. But they had to learn the whole business acumen. And they even said, we wish that was actually part of the curriculum. It should actually be integrated into the WSET or in the Wine Scholar Guild. One of these schools one day has to implement yeah. this. But you jumped ahead of them all. This school is probably the first, because even Algonquin College, I was interviewed to teach beer and get teach the Prude Home program, but it never lifted off. And I don't know what happened, budgets, and then COVID swung along, and that just went flying out the window. But what a great experience. You know what? We're going to have a toast to that. I have a rare me, You're going to toast. Let, let me, let me see know? if I can find something here, too. Yeah, sure. I'll talk a bit about this while you're reaching out. This, Michael, was a bottle that was shipped to me. Um, a gentleman by the name of Luigi Stramor from Italy works with Gemin. I believe he's one of the family members. This is a generationally owned vineyard in the uh, Prosecco region around Val d'Albia Dene. And uh, of course, this is the Glera grape. Um, this is unique. This was shipped to me. I mean, anybody that ships me some wine from Italy during the pandemic, I have to love and showcase. And Come on, they, they go up some... on your Christmas card list, don't they? Yeah, oh yeah, they do. <laughs> this is great wine. And I, I had the rosé, which I believe was like 85% Glera, 15% Pinot Noir. We're just gonna, there we go. I got that pretty well. But if you don't know much about Prosecco, it undergoes the Martinotti, Martinotti or the Charmant method. So the fermentation is in a large stainless steel tank undergoes typically one fermentation, unlike other traditional sparkling wines, which go through two, the second one being in bottle, where they add a bit of yeast, a bit of sugar, they seal it. It's more of a base still wine that they allow to go up an alcohol level. And it also causes all the carbonation to really be added into the wine itself. This is done into a tank and, you know, it's nice and clean, zesty, you, know, you get those lemon notes, you get some peach notes in there. I always find that Prosecco is a great party starter, especially if you're, uh, you don't want to spend a pile of money on a, on a decent champagne uh, or uh, French Accorda or some of these massively successful traditional sparkling wines. What do you have there, my friend? Cheers well, to I, you, by the way, and cheers we're, to we're, the audience. We're both thinking the same thing today. I, I when you told me we're going to have something, some, pick something. I thought, well, I, I want to pick, I want to pick some sparkling wine. Excellent. Um, and I wanted to pick sparkling wine because we don't drink enough of it. People are afraid of sparkling wine. They think it's only a wine for celebration. You know, the house was sold. I bought the car. I got married. <laughs> the kids are born. Very but, North American. You know, yeah. But I mean, sparkling wine is fantastic. I'm a big fan. Big fan. Cheers, of my friend. Cheers, Cheers my to friend. you. Much love. Great to have you, you on the show. You know, and this is part of the extraordinary drinks of extraordinary people. You know, you're an yeah. extraordinary individual. You've done fantastic things in this industry. You continue to do so post-retirement into your whole new life. 
And these are great wines. You're right. Why don't people just have this on a hot afternoon? Yeah, you know, sparkling wine is more affordable. Um, and it's, you know, you should have at least one bottle of sparkling wine a month. Uh, the one I chose is, is from Ontario because I'm still an advocate for Ontario wine. 13th uh, this Street, is, This eh? is 13th Street. Uh, great it's winery. Rosé Cuvée. Uh, J.P. Cola is the uh, winemaker. It's 70% Pinot Noir, 30% Chardonnay. It's made in the uh, traditional method, as you were ex explaining. Um, and it, this, uh, this is something I picked up a few years ago uh, when we were down visiting in Niagara. And uh, it's nice to try sparkling wines that have aged a little bit as well. So that's, that's fun. Yeah. This has got beautiful nose, lots of red berry fruit coming through on it. Uh, it's very refreshing. Nice. And I noticed as well, Rob, that we are both not using flutes. No. Uh, and I'm, I'm a big fan of a, well, something with a bigger bowl. Yes. Uh, so you can really smell yes. it and let those aromas come out. And Well, the flute was really accentuated, especially from the roaring 20s on in modern culture. And if you look at the champagne flute, the problem with it is, you know, when we got something open, like this is really open, but if you got an open glass, like your glass is ideal, it, the esters, because carbonation, not only does it help with acidity, and you'll learn about that in beer more than in wine courses, but it does. This uh, the, uh, carbonation uh, adds sharpness to a wine. In this case, these tend to be acidic. This is nice and acidic. It's dry. Yeah. It's a medium and light body, but the glassware allows those esters from the carbonation to really come up and you can capture the aromas much better, I find personally, and most wine pros would agree, than a flute. Yeah. And the wine, the wine makes a difference, or the glass can make a difference. Oh, yeah. I had the pleasure of being part of a, a design, a glass design with Riddell when we created a glass Ooh, for ice good wine. Good glass company, yeah. And uh, it, it was interesting to see the dynamics of stemware and how it, uh, it can influence your perception of taste. But, but for sparkling wine, I, I've always found that they're awkward to drink out of, this, the flutes. They're beautiful on a table. Gorgeous. They're dressing things up. They're lovely in photographs. But if I'm tasting wine, and actually it's with any wine, I, I like to have one glass. And for red, for white, it can be the same glass. At least your glass is consistent and you can really start to pick up nuances when you're trying different wines out of the same glass. Uh, when we were designing the ice wine glass, I poured ice wine in three different glasses and had my staff come and try it and give me their tasting notes. And nobody thought it was the same wine. All because of all because of the glass. It's, yeah, the glass really has a massive influence. You know, we could spend an hour on just a glassware segment. Uh, you have different glasses for different styles of wine. There's different glasses for every different style of beer. You go into Belgium and they literally have a different glass for yeah. every style of beer out there. You know, That's we're going right. to wrap things up. I think you've just now, been before a great you wrap guest. it. One thing that one thing you want to mention <laughs> to viewers with sparkling wine. Yes, they get afraid. They think they have to open the bottle and drink the whole bottle. That's not true. You can reseal the bottle with items yes. like this. Just put this back on. Clip it down, clip it down like this one. Well, I guess there we go. There, bring it in here to the. Got it. We see it. Yep. We yeah. see it. So what know, a fabulous device. Yeah. So these these are very inexpensive, and they fit on. Put it back in the fridge. You can drink it over three days. Not a problem. You know, and I, the last step I was going to say about this is you're right about the champagne flute as well. The problem when you're in a cocktail party, you know, how many times have you seen the waiter bobble? And the glasses just fly <laughs> everywhere. And it's just a bad experience. And it's true. I mean, if you're watching this, open face glasses, stemless or stemmed, depending on your preference, really. Stemless are always options. in the summertime. Stemless always in the summertime outside. Stemmed glasses blow over on the patio table and oh, yeah. expensive to replace. Yeah, same thing. Somebody uh, invariably has had a couple too many drinks. They bobble that table for a second. Just the foot or the knee hits it. And you've got a problem. You're, somebody's playing a nasty game of 52 pickup with glassware. So. Clean up on aisle three. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you've been great. Um, what a storied career you've had. What a varied career. And for wine students watching this or beverage students, beer students, I, let's just group them in as beverage students. There's an awful lot you can learn from Michael. Again, I'll have some notes that you can reach out to him. He's brilliant. If you're in the Toronto area, 
or actually it doesn't really matter where you are. If you want a high quality school and a high quality uh, source of very valuable education, and really a year of your time is not a lot of time to dedicate to something like this. George Brown uh, College is definitely a great school. Check out their school of hospitality. Michael, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed this broadcast. This is the virtual happy hour experience with the drunken grape. Extraordinary drinks with extraordinary people. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever you decide to do, have a terrific day. Happy, happy hour. Cheers to you. Cheers to you, Michael. This is Rob from the Drunken Grape.